The I Ching is really a very small book. It is, however, the core text of Chinese civilization. It is said by Javari Karil to be the foundation on which the essence of Chinese philosophical thought was built. It is also a book that every candidate for government, beginning in the Sui dynasty until the dissolution of the imperial examination system in the early 20th century, was required to memorize. Confucius is said to have written a great commentary on the I Ching in the 6th century, and this would later be also required study for all potential candidates for the examination system. In it, Confucius presents the I Ching as a cosmological system, as something that can be understood in terms of the cycle of yin and yang. He writes, one moment of yin and one moment of yang is called the Tao. You might also see these characters represented in a lot of Asian iconography. So for instance, the flag of Korea has the characters from the I Ching represented in it. Javari Karil says that it is the most perfect of all abstract ideograms found in the I Ching. Its authentic visual harmony leaves you in awe when you realize that each of its elements has gone through its own development, analogous to that which is told of the overall picture, and that each of the six parts of each element also plays the same tune. Thus, abstract logical numerology came to be the prior and universal justification for Chinese astronomy and also the divination of astronomy that was the basis of Chinese imperial authority. It was the ambition of later Confucian cosmologists, just as it was the ambition of Shang diviners to find an a priori and logical and universal system with which we could predict the future of calendrical and astronomical events, to know in advance the operations of phenomenal nature through a system of pure logical operators. Thus, correlationist thought assumes a unity of heaven and earth. Heaven and earth are abstracted as dual categories of human understanding, but ultimately united in the grand monistic unity of the Tao. And thus all the operations of nature and spirit are totally united and undivided, and what we consider to be the artificial and social conditions of human life are themselves subordinate to the monistic unity of Tao and the cosmic nature. And this is why the artificiality of Confucian statecraft was thought to be subordinated to the natural law of the Tao, the mandate of heaven, and of nature itself, in a grand natural monism that characterized traditional Chinese religion. Thus, later Confucianism, although it ostensibly distinguished itself from the supernatural and superstitious practices of Chinese religious Taoism, was in fact, in its very conception, subordinated to the natural law of heaven, the mandate of heaven, and the laws and operations of the Tao, of which Chinese statecraft ultimately intended to model itself upon, imitate as a microcosm within the macrocosm of nature. For this reason, Imperial Confucianism can be seen as an outgrowth, a manifestation in society and politics and statecraft of traditional Chinese Taoism. Just as Confucius claimed to the Analects, the later Confucian literati would also be the heirs of the Wei, the Tao of the Shaman Diviners, which had been used to predict the future and which amongst the Confucian literati would be continually studied as a way of managing, organizing, and controlling the body politic. The pervasiveness and continuity of fivefold numerology can thereby be seen as the effect of its instrumentalization by the imperial authorities of Confucian statecraft as the means of legitimating and justifying the authority of the emperor and the imperial bureaucracy. Yin and Yang are thought to have entered Chinese vocabulary sometime during the Warring Sage period. As we've already seen, they seem to be already present in the binary opposition of the logical operators in the I Ching. Now, from the conception of yin and yang and the I Ching that we've seen, in the Han Dynasty, there was a systematic effort to create a natural cosmology, that is, a logos of the cosmos. Han Chinese were very interested in this because, of course, it creates the logical conditions for understanding the necessary causes of cycles and phenomena in nature, such as illnesses in the body and also how to remedy the medical practices. This was very much required understanding of the correlation between the phenomena in nature and the natural laws, natural laws that were thought to be exemplified in the abstract logical operators of the I Ching. Many Western scholars have described the thought of the relationship between natural bodies and natural phenomena in Chinese cosmology as a system of what's called correlationist thought, that is correlating events that happen disparately together. So for instance, phases of the planets or the relationship between the planets can be related to the phases of activities or operations within the body and also to the relation of the organs of the body. And correlation is simply the linking in thought of different and disparate activities. So great was the significance and so wide the influence of what Joseph Needham once called the correlative thinking, the heart of traditional cosmology, that it might well be regarded as a sort of perennial philosophy in the history of Chinese civilization. For this mode of correlative thinking, things within a category resonate with one another more strongly, reliably, and predictably than do other things that are not in the same category. As the Huananza puts it, things within the same class mutually move each other, the root and the branch respond to one another. Or again, all things are the same as their qi, all things respond to their own class. The effect of the qi at a distance was called the idea of resonance, or kanying, or ganying. 
resonance or ganying between and amongst things within a class is conceived of both as a basic stuff in the concrete phenomena and as an intangible vibrating medium pervading the empty space. To quote John S. Major, Heaven and Earth, and Early Han Thought. There are Western, ancient, and modern corollaries of the idea of chi. In ancient Stoicism, it was conceived as the subtle pneuma of matter. And in, today, we might even think of it as the matter-energy substrate that underlies all of the changes between matter and energy in quantum mechanics. During the Han Dynasty, Tong Chung Shu, his contemporaries, would thoroughly naturalize the physical medium of qi, which had formerly been conceived as a spiritual correlation between the powers and potencies of nature. Even further still, Tung Chung Shu and Lu Ziong in the first century BC would extend the resonance theory of Gan Ying to all of the social relations so that the cardinal Confucian social virtues of loyalty, filial piety would be corresponded with the, with the proper resonant responses of benefits received from one's ruler and from one's parents. John P. Henderson in The Development and Decline of Chinese Cosmology writes, The idea of correspondence between the figures of the change and the figures of heavens furnished the cosmological basis for the science and mathematical astronomy during the Han period. It set the basic terms for all cosmological discourse of later Han commentators. Correlative thought is said to be the most basic reading of Chinese cosmology. Correlative thinking, in general, draws systematic correspondences among aspects of various orders of reality, or realms of the cosmos, such as the human body, the body politic, and the heavenly bodies. It assumes that these related orders are, as a whole, cosmologous, that they correspond with one another in some basic respect even in some cases that their identities are contained within one another. Lu Shi Chung Chi, the master Lu of the Spring and Autumn Annuals, writes, Man is similar to heaven and earth, thus the ancients in ordering themselves in the realm necessarily modeled themselves on heaven and earth. And in Confucius Analects, Great indeed was Yao as a sovereign. How majestic was he? It is only heaven that is grand, and only Yao that corresponded to it. How vast his virtue was, that people could find no name for it. Confucius says, He who exercises government by means of his virtues may be compared to the North Pole Star, which keeps its place as all the other stars turn around it. In this way, the likening of the virtuous ruler to the Pole Star and the Analects helped to inspire the idea of correspondence between the state and the cosmos, says John P. Henderson in The Development of Decline of Chinese Cosmology. Moreover, the correspondence or correlation theory of the relationship between nature and man was also meant to be embodied in the state so that the bureaucracy and the um, activities of the state were meant to manifest the will of heaven, to manifest the same order of the natural world. We've seen how yin and yang have derived from, or can be abstracted from, the changes in the logical operators that are present in the I Ching. One of the other basic doctrines of traditional Chinese medicine is Wu Sing, or five element theory. That is the changing of the phases of the elements from fire to wood to metal to water to earth. And this doesn't seem to be directly, immediately derivable from the binary opposition of yin and yang, or even the changes of yin to yang and yin to yin. Obviously, five is a different number than two. So one question that arose both in contemporary scholarship, but also in the Han Dynasty when these numerological categories were being formulated, was how is it that we can understand the different elements in relation to one another, or the different seasons in relation to one another, if we only have this binary opposition, or dualistic opposition between yin and yang? John B. Henderson, in The Development and Decline of Chinese Cosmology, writes, Wu Xing, in its mature form, was not just a means of classification, it was also the basis of a comprehensive theory for explaining change in the cosmos. In the pre-Han era, however, Wu Xing was only one of several commonly used enumerated orders. Classical sources, such as the documents of classics, also record numerologies based on 3, 4, 6, 9, 10, and 12. This raises the question of why five-based numerology eclipsed its rivals in the early Han era. One explanation might involve objective factors, for example, the fact that the five and only five planets are visible to the naked eye. John Mayer has recently argued that the five are derived from the visible planets. A big problem that would later emerge for Chinese calendrists who were attempting to define the seasons of the calendar in terms of fivefold numerology was how to fit the four seasons into five phases. And different solutions were proposed to this, the most popular being to simply divide summer into two seasons, or alternatively, to add a series of additional days at the end of each of the four seasons that would cumulatively contribute to a fifth season. Later, the five-fold numerology would be expanded and correlated with other aspects of society and nature in a bonanza of five-fold correlationist thought. Han cosmologists extended this list of things grouped by five and associated it with the Wu Zing, naming the five planets, the five seasons, five directions, five colors, five musical tones, five sagely emperors, five viscera, five orifices, five animals, five grains, five mountains, five reservoirs. Ho oh, Hu Tuong even attempts to explain the physical configuration of the five punishments by reference to the steps of mutual conquest, order of the five phases. The record of rites, the Li Qi, mentions 62 kinds of five, even the five turnings of the royal boat.